Alright, so I'm just gonna make a module. Let's start from scratch. Gonna make a module. I am. Well, I'm not gonna start from scratch because I'm gonna import this. I'm gonna import data the balls. Uh, data the ball. Oh, you have to do an open import. How's it going, subroutine? We're gonna do some Agda today. Okay, so bull. What, what do we want to prove about bulls? Uh, there's a couple of uh, cool things I like about bullions. Or operations and bullions. Uh, should we do... Let's go identipotent. So, our function is identip identipotent if... Uh, hmm. <laughs> True is not false. I could prove that. I'll, I, I can show you how to prove that. That's, that's actually something interesting about that. Uh, so, let's say for all F and B's, F of F of B is the same as F of B. So that's the mathematical idea of identipotent. Oh, whoops. That needs to be equals. Okay. Actually, but identity is a type. So hang on. I'm gonna write. I'm gonna write it like that. What is this? Relation dot binary dot propositional quality. I think that's it. Propositional quality. Yeah. There we go. This is uh, given a function that takes a to a, given an a, think that should work, no, whoops, so I'm just trying, I'm just trying to write out a type. Set three should be function type, but it's not. It should be. Oh. I'll explain this in a second. Okay, cool. Okay, it's compiling. So, uh, what this. It took me a little while to write this out, but what, what this is saying is we've got an uh, implicit argument when you've got uh, these braces around something. That's, that means uh, implicit argument. This is a uh, function. So, we're saying at the type. We're saying uh, it's just a function type. So f is a function. Actually, I think yeah, I can get rid of that. I can. Should be able to get rid of that. There we go. I should be able to get rid of this as well. I don't actually need to. I'm not actually using these at the type level, so I can get rid of them. There we go. So this is uh, an implicit argument. It just says that for all types a, give me a function from a to a. Give me an a. And then uh, identipotent is. Uh, is the property that f of f of b equals f of b. I actually think I want to get rid of this and I want to move that in here. So I actually want to be existential. I think I want to be able to say this. So a function is identical if for all inputs this property holds. Yeah, it doesn't have type class because it's got some uh, form of implicit, implicit arguments, yeah. Alright, um, so, does this type signature make sense to anyone? Is anyone confused by this? There's a little bit going on here. For all, uh, for all types, given a function from that type, from a value of that type to a, to a value of that type, um, then we get back set. Set is actually means like type, so this is actually like a type alias. What we're basically writing here is a type alias. And so, identipotent takes a function, and then for all inputs to that function, f of f of b equals f of b. So basically, running the running the function twice is the same as running it once. Set is a type. Um, there's a hierarchy in Agda, so uh, set has the kind uh, set one. Which would have the set, uh, which would have the kind uh, set 
two. It, it, there's a whole hierarchy of, of sets. Uh, it's called, uh, I think that's... Yeah. They, 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 uh, I think they call them universes. Alright, so uh, the ID function is... Uh, oh, actually, let's, let's go with something more interesting. Um, if you have a boolean and you and true with it, so if you've got false uh, and true, that's the same as... Uh, sorry, false and true and true. That's the same as false and true. So basically, running the function once is the same... Oh, sorry, running the function twice is the same as running it once. Does that make sense? I think it's just and. I think if you do and false, it's the same, right? Yeah, I think that's the same. So I'm just going to say that, uh... So what I'm claiming here is that for all, uh, for all booleans, there's only two, but for all booleans, uh, it's identical if you and something, or if you and that boolean onto onto a value. All right. So you can see here down the bottom here. This is what we're going to prove. I've put if when you put in a, a question mark in in Agda and you load it up. So I'm pressing Control C, Control L, which loads it up. Uh, which sends it basically sends the buffer to uh, Agda and Agda's finds or type checks it and when it type checks it, it it says that uh you know there was a question mark in here so this is a goal that we're going to prove so I am going to prove this property and the way to do this um, is to split uh, we split the uh, booleans so we get, basically we we check each case. So here, if I come over here and press Control C, Control C, it says, "Give me uh, pattern variables to case split on." So I should be able to say B1. I think I don't, can't remember if I want to split on B1 or B2 or B or just B. That'll that actually change things slightly, just because the definition of this thing. So I can actually go Agda, go to definition. Here we go. Okay, so the first argument, you see how the definition of uh, AND uses the first argument to, to implement this. So if we actually are uh, case split on the first argument, and we load this up, we can actually just come in here and press Control C, Control A, and that'll put in this, uh, it'll automatically do, a pr uh, do something called proof search. So if I go back to question mark, if I come here and press Control C, Control A, it just did a proof search, and it just figures out how to prove that. So basically, what it does is it finds uh, the constructors of this data type. So this is uh, equality. Let me see if I can go to this definition. Yeah, here we go. So this is equality, and all it does is uh, it's got <coughs> it takes two uh, two arguments takes two arguments which are the two values like so basically you can say uh, true equals false so that's the so that's the, this is the type and the implementation of that I mean you can't you can't you can't prove that but you can prove that refl and that's because what happens here is that you, you can only instantiate this data type if these two arguments are the same so if it, only if these two arguments on both sides are the same can you implement uh, uh, that data type? You can only construct it using REFL if they're the same on both sides. So uh, when Agda does a proof search, what it does uh, is it says, what constructors can I, like, let me find a constructor I can use and chuck in here. And so it searches through and it says, well, can I use REFL? And then it tries to basically, uh, what would you call it, like instantiate the uh, arguments and, and figure out if it can uh, implement, if it can just use this. And so in our case, it, it can. So it basically just finds, it just types in REFL for us because it knows it can. 
So there you go, we've proven that running, uh, we've proven this property. is well, it's for all A and B's A and we've proven that that is the same as we have a proof of that now and the actor did most of the work for us I mean I'm using the standard library and I just did a proof search and case split but yeah What's, uh, anyone got any other idempotent functions they want me to have a go at? Uh, there's, uh, could do this one. Just looking at this type, this gets gets a little bit detailed. But what we're saying here is, uh, this is the identity function. Uh, this is an implicit argument A, and that actually represents the level that the set's at. So that set is at this A level. So uh, what I want to actually do is specify the type of this identity function. Otherwise, I'm just not going to be able to infer it. Okay, so this is, um, we should be able to prove that the identity function is idempotent. Uh, the thing is, we don't actually need the arguments to prove this, I don't think. There we go. So I just knows that running the identity function twice is the same as running it once. It's just, identity is super simple. So there you go, I mean, that's, that's, that's really simple, that one. Cool. Um, so let's, uh, so uh, we know that, um, that's our dependency. Let, let's talk about another one that I like, which is uh, 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 involutions. I really like involutions. That's another, that's another algebraic property. Involution. And the property of an involution is that running this function twice is not the same as running it once. It's running the function twice is the same as running it no times. So if you run the function twice, you get back to the original uh, value you started off with. And one for booleans, of course, is not. Yeah, XOR is another one, yeah. Let's start off with this one and we'll, uh, yeah, we'll do that. Actually, is, is XOR one? Actually, I have a feeling it might not be. We'll have a look, we'll have a go. I mean, the only way to find out is to have a go, isn't it? Alright, so... The uh, the way to do this would be, obviously, to case split again, split the two parts. Hey, hi Switch, how's it going? We're doing some Magda today. So here we go, this is how we prove not. We just split on the input arguments, we see true. And you can see here, if we come over here it says not not true equals true and if you go through that and you think about it in your head yeah that's the same so you can just press you can just press control C control A and A will find a solution for you 
So usually the way to way to do proofs in Agda, I mean the way that I usually do it is write out the type that I want. Uh, that's usually the thing that takes the longest. Uh, the implementation takes two seconds because usually what you do is you start implementing it, um, figure out the best type, uh, sorry, figure out the best variable to, to split on. You split on it and then you uh, just press Control C, Control A, and try and let Agda f figure out a solution for you. That's usually the way I go. So I think Excel will not be one. Let's let's have a go though. So I just realized that my, my microphone's a little bit far away. Okay, here we go. XOR, let's try XOR. So an involution, what's the XOR operator? Excel operator. Yeah, apply a constant. Yeah. Yep. So we'll do what, like what we did with uh, with the and operator. Hey Ryan, held. How's it going? Thanks for that follow. Let's go XOR. Let's try. I don't know. I don't know. Let's let's see. It, would X be an involution? It would not be an involution, would it? Would it be idempotent? I don't think it'd be idempotent, would it? So what I'm, what I'm doing is uh, looking at the XOR definition. You can see that the first argument is the thing that uh, XOR is splitting on. So if we do that. For us, XOR, A, XOR, B, XOR, okay, so maybe I've maybe got in the wrong arguments, okay, got in the wrong order, we'll see. So let's split on this B, just be the first argument, okay, so it says that true XOR, true XOR, B1 equals B1, that's not true, okay, so I think we need to flip this, let's try that. This is what you're claiming, right? A, X or B, X or B equals A. Yeah, that is what you, that is, that is the claim. So why can't I prove this? Yeah, it doesn't like either of these. Oh, cause I've chosen the involution, right? Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think that is true, actually. I think there's something going on there. I don't think that is true. You're totally ignorant of Agda. Agda can improve something like Quicksort? Yes, it definitely can improve something like Quicksort. Um, in fact, there's a... What is it? Total proof of sorting. So not only can it can it prove Quicksort, it can, definitely can. Um, the complete correctness of sorting. This is a really, really good blog post. I, I absolutely love this blog post. So not only can you uh, prove that it's like, so you can you can write out the type, it's pretty involved. You can do it, it definitely can do it. Um, you'll probably spend like, like a week or so trying to prove it if you're like, uh, even if you're kind of skilled at, at Agda, like it's, it's there's a lot of stuff that you have to work on. Um, I don't know, maybe some people that are like super skilled at Agda will be able to do it in a couple of days. So I, it'll take me probably a couple of weeks, a week or two. Um, there's just, there's a lot of goal, there's a lot going on, um, but What's really cool about this is that uh, not only uh, does this person prove uh, merge, uh, is it merge sort? I think it's merge sort. Merge sort. Yeah, set it up. They proved merge sort, but they also proved the uh, computational complexity of it. So they actually make like a timed thing. And this is basically like a timed monad type thing. Um, and they basically just prove that. Uh, that not only is merge sort, does it actually sort the list, it also uh, does it in the expected time that it should be doing it. So they proved the implementation correct in, in two different ways. They proved it in terms of input to output, but also uh, runtime complexity. Super cool. Uh, 
All right, so that's uh, idempotent functions, involutions. Both are really cool uh, concepts. If you've got any more involutions or uh, idempotent functions, check them out. Me, we'll, we'll have a good quick go at proving them. But I want to move more towards writing maybe a monad. No, monoid. Bitwise XOR holds that property. Oh, bitwise XOR, not not Boolean XOR. Is that the difference? Interesting. Bitwise XOR and not Boolean XOR. What's the di what's the difference between the definitions of Boolean XOR and bitwise XOR? Um, I'd I'd I would spend a couple weeks on this. Uh, it's pretty detailed. I wonder if these, the code's somewhere on one. Yeah, it's involved. Here we go, full code is on GitHub. Uh, if you look at this, you can see why I'd spend a long time on it. Like, it's, it's involved. Yeah, like, look at that. It's, it's super involved. Can we try to prove bitwise though? If you give me the definition of bitwise uh, XOR, I'll do it. Um, I'm not sure if there's a... I don't know if there's like a bitwise in here. I'll definitely do it, I just don't know how to, like, how to get that code in here. Um, Yeah, I've only got Boolean XOR, so XOR and Booleans. If you can translate uh, XOR to work over Booleans, like an actual bitwise XOR to work over Booleans. Boolean bitwise XOR. Bitwise AND. Yeah, if you can translate it over to a uh, Googled Agda XOR. Even talks about involution. Oh wow, okay. Oh cool, I'll bring that up. Bitwise XOR. Right, so they have to find their own bitwise XOR somewhere. So we don't have that. Unless there's one... I don't think there's one in the Steam library. Yeah, there's not. So that's what we need. We can use... Yeah, we can prove it probably... Oh wow, why is that so complicated? Interesting. Oh, maybe that's, maybe that's my problem. Maybe there is a involution. Back. So it looks like uh, in that in their proof they're actually splitting on both sides, which I wouldn't expect because in here we're not splitting on both sides. But I mean this one also involves a not B, so that's that probably explains something actually. So I probably have to at least split the true case. Okay. All right, let's try that. Okay, that holds. That holds. False doesn't. Okay, let's split on that. I don't. So I reckon there's probably a problem around this then. Okay. No, there we go. Okay, I just split on all the cases. You're actually, you are right. This is an, uh, XOR is an involution. There we go. Just have to split on all the cases for some reason. Uh, I'm not quite sure why here. Well, that doesn't make sense to me. This makes sense. Having a split on this makes sense because... <laughs> Glad that you insisted. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was... Yeah. Just because I, I can't do it doesn't mean that uh, it doesn't hold. Cool. So this makes sense to me, that the first one, like having to split on true, on the right hand side of true also makes sense because, so true comes in here, then it, then we, then the implementation is not B. 
So to figure out what the uh, actual result would be, we'll also have to know what B is, this B here. So that makes sense to me. But here, to know what B is going to be, like, we know the result is just going to be B, so I don't know. Anyway, I'm happy with that, that's cool. So XOR is an involution, that's awesome. Yeah, Agda is super cool. Alright, let's, let's, uh, I don't know if you've done anything with, uh, that <laughs> DJ Cobra Functor. Um, so I'm not sure if you've done anything with, um, monoids before, but we'll, we'll write a monoid. Um, so let's, uh, so records. There we go. Things come up in yellow sometimes, get highlighted yellow when Agda can't infer things. Coming from Haskell is Agda very hard. Um, that's that's tricky. Uh, it can be. Agda can be can be hard. Um, yeah, parts are quite different. I mean, I don't know. I, have you, how how much have you been following along so far? Have you been struggling with this or? I mean, syntactically, it's very similar. I mean, that's 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 one good reason why um, for both Agda and Idris, they're both uh, syntactically very similar. So you don't have to learn any new syntax, really. I mean, you do, but not not a huge amount. Like if you go to Cock, if you go to uh, so there's Idris, Agda, Cock. There's there's a few others as well, but these are these are popular ones. You saw the XOR conf, okay. Um, Okay, well we'll do some more, and you you should be able to you should be able to you might be able to tell uh, where you'll where you'll have problems. So it, it, in Idris, uh, Idris and Agda both have a Haskell like syntax. Idris particular like a lot more than Agda, um, but they both got uh, they both got Haskell like syntax. Uh, Cock does not have anything like uh, like Haskell syntax, so you have to learn a whole new syntax as well. And there's a lot of uh, terms and stuff in there that's like it, it's it's for people that know how to prove things, which is not like I, I've learned how to prove things through programming. I haven't really, I never really had like a, a strong mathematical background or anything. So uh, I've learned, I've learned how to do this using Agda. I've learned how to prove things using Agda. I haven't really done any actual proofs outside of, of programming. And Coq has like a, a lot of terminology around, uh, you know, a lot of logic terminology and, and things that I'm not familiar with. I'd like to be more familiar with it. And that's why I'm trying to learn Coq, but, uh, I'm not. So Idris and Agda though, you know, you just you just write code um, and you prove things. And so the code usually has something to do with programming. So it's it's not, it's a bit more familiar with me. So so these two are, are a bit more familiar to me. So I think if you're going to pick up something to le to learn how to prove things, I'd look into Idris and Agda. If you if you are familiar with with Haskell already, if you are a logician or you know anything about that, um, have a look at Cock. Cock is very cool. All right, so we're going to write a monoid. I'm just going to use this operation, which is just a, I don't know, a circle with that through it. I don't know how you how you would even call that. Let's. That is circled asterisk. There you go. We're going to use circle asterisk. Oh yeah, TLA plus. TLA plus is a, it's a specialized kind of uh, proof assistant for uh, distributed. Uh, it's good at uh, doing distributed uh, like concurrent concurrent actor stuff. And you'll try and figure out like when you've got two things that are trying to trying to compute something or trying to access like some sort of resource you can it'll make you figure out when things aren't safe like when things aren't locked when you're gonna have concurrent problems race conditions and stuff. All right, so this is a monoid. Oh, hang on, that's not quite. A, uh, let, let's start with semigroup. So this is a semigroup, right? It's got the append operation, but there is actually a property that you have to make sure you prove. Well, in, in Haskell we don't prove it, but yeah, there is a property that you meant to hold, which is that uh, what is it? A
that is the same as the same as that. What have I done there? Oh, missed out the operator. There we go. I'm just gonna modify this line to get rid of that highlight. Okay. So to make a semi group for a type. We have to implement this uh, append operation, and we have to prove that that operation is associative. So hopefully this is somewhat readable. This is the associativity property. So basically, the associative property associative property uh, just means that uh, parentheses don't matter. So we're going to make a semi group. Uh, we'll make a semi-group for uh, that AND operation we had, because that is also, yeah, AND is idempotent, but it's also uh, associative, so we'll have a semi-group for booleans. So this will literally be the AND operator. But now we need to prove that our AND is associative, so let's make a definition up here. Which is that... Uh, So the way we usually do this again is split, proof search, done. I didn't really know how to implement that, I just pressed a couple of key combinations and Active found it out for me, so easy. There we go. So AND is a semigroup. It's a binary operation. That's associative. Binary associative operation. That's what that's what a semigroup is. Um, do we have any other good uh, any good semigroups we could write? I mean, we could do the same thing for or. Yep, yeah, it just makes everything magic. And it seems like it's magic. It's, I mean, the, the actual underlying theory in that is actually pretty straightforward. It's, it's super cool. Yeah, just proving things by uh, Emacs shortcuts. So may as well, I mean, this is it's going to be exactly the same thing. Hey Sage Grid, how's it going? Thanks for uh, thanks for the tab. All right, what's going on? Okay, semi group, semi group. We've got semi groups. Okay, so that's one. That's one. Uh, I don't know. I think it's pretty cool that uh, like in Haskell we can't write this. We can't write that. There are kind of some extensions to do that, but it's not. It's not straightforward, and it's definitely when you. If you are able to write like a fancy type like that, the implementation is not like that. The implementation is not so straightforward. Um, you have to enable a lot of extensions to be able to write something like that, and you kind of own it's 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 similar, but it's not it's not quite like that. Uh, yeah, it's, it's only similar. This is a lot more simple. Uh, the the similarity is that in in Haskell, what you have is you've got something called data data kinds, um, which lifts values into types. Um, and types of, of values into into kinds. So basically, you can use uh, you can use values 
from from data from data types as uh, as types. So if you did that, if you lifted those uh, those values into the type level, then you could maybe write something like this. But then, because you've lifted it, then you have to write all your functions over the lifted uh, data to the type. So then you have to write instead of writing just functions, you have to write like type functions. But it gets super complicated. All right, so I'm gonna um, mm, let's. I guess let's go on to mono then. Are there any questions about semi-group? So a monoid has a semi-group. Uh, Andrew is the most famous between Idris and Cock. Um, no, I wouldn't really say... I wouldn't really say any are, are more advanced. They've all just got different trade-offs. They've just got each each one's got different trade-off. Um, yeah, in Idris for a while there was a tactic. There's something called tactics. Let me see if I can find. Uh, I mean, you can see this is deprecated, but it had, uh, I don't know if I can find any examples of it. Just trying to find a little example of it. Here we go. So the, it, Idris at one point had this little tactic language. Um, and this is more like how you write proofs in uh, in Coq. Um, so to write a proof, you have to you basically just have these set. You have instructions, and so intro like brings all the variables into into scope. Uh, induction performs induction on the variable. Raffle, in, uh, you know, if the goal. So basically, the way you've got it is you've got a goal. You've got a tree of goals, and you write an imperative language to basically like it's kind of like a zipper. You kind of zip through the. Uh, through that tree and you uh, when you see like raffle that actually means like I finished the goal so that goal gets removed from the tree and then you can move on to the next node in the tree and then you have to prove that and when you you can do things like intro which introduces uh, actually maybe not intro but like there's, there's uh, induction which introduces another goal so you kind of you've got one goal you kind of split it apart you solve one part and then you go to the other part and you solve that part um, so you're kind of making your own tree you start off with a tree but then you, you kind of Expand nodes and then solve the nodes and remove them from the tree. And you, but you've got an imperative language for working over it, so that's what a tactic basically is. Um, and Cock uses tactics everywhere. Idris used to have a little tactic language; they got rid of that. Um, and when they got rid of that, that's kind of when because I, I mean this is it's imperative; it's very imperative. Um, and there's kind of like an interactive uh, interact. There used to be an interactive tool. I don't know if that still exists, but there used to be a little interactive tool that you could go into. And it would tell you what the goals are, and so it was pretty, you know, straightforward. You had the goal, and you saw it, and then you wrote some imperative t statements to play around with the goal, and then you proved it, and then you press save, and then you got, s and then this got spat out at the end. This whole thing got spat out. Um, so that was really easy to get started with. I don't, uh, Idris removed their tactic language. They've got something else now, but I don't know. I haven't really played around with this. So I don't know. So that's that's kind of like that was one of the difference between Idris's and uh, Idris and Agdal. When Idris removed this or deprecated this, I went well. There was kind of like a period where uh, Idris didn't really have like have any tool similar to this, so uh, it was basically on the same level as Agda to me, because um, it didn't have this imperative language, which I found very uh, I don't know. It was something that I got used to, so it was something that I, that was kind of easy for me, and I and I got used to. So when it got rid of that, I went well. If it doesn't have that, then what's, what's what benefit does it have over Agda? And for me, it wasn't much. So I started playing around with Agda, and I quite like Agda. But I wouldn't say Agda is more more advanced. Um, it's just got different things. Um, what I have found, though, is Idris has got a few bugs in it. Um, Agda's got other bugs in different ways. But uh, I don't know. Agda seems a little bit more stable than what, what I'd call uh, Idris. I wouldn't say Idris is the most stable thing.
Um, but Cock is very different. Cock is completely... is very different. And it's all based on tactics, so if you do like the idea of like having an imperative tool to go through and transform your goals and having a proof tree, um, look at Cock. That's how it works. I don't know if I can get a good example of some cock, cock code. Yeah, I mean, this, these are really, really simple ones. So this is kind of like how in our code we've got our whatever equals raffle. So raffle is short for reflexivity. And so that's the type that we're proving, then that, that's the equal sign equals raffle. Done. But if we go down, I wonder if we'll see some. It's basically an imperative language for you to walk through. I'm not sure if I'm going to get any good examples. Actually, isn't that Rosetta code? Here we go, proof. This is what we want. Let's just have a quick look at this. So here you go. See how this is kind of like an imperative language. So introduce, eliminate, trivial, intro, simple, case split on this thing, intros. So this is the case split. Notice how we're doing over here. The case splitting is just pattern matching. Over here, we've actually got a command for it. So case split on that thing. So this is, I mean, and what I was saying before is that if you're a logician, this probably makes a little bit more sense. But for me, like assumption, okay, I guess, okay. What's that useful for? Like what, when do you use assumptions? Whereas in this, um, like maybe we are doing assumptions in places, I don't know, but um, we're using code, we're using like things that I'm more familiar with than, than the word assumption. I would like to know, like I'd like to learn what, what assumptions are in, in logic, I'm not just not good at logic, so... Yeah. I'm trying to get better at Quark, I am. And this is, this is kind of the thing about lifting, there's... Oh, there's probably some stuff here somewhere. Wow, well, okay, yeah, that's pretty bad. But yeah, it, it, you can see that um, this is Idris here, and Idris is very similar to Agda. So it equals Raffle, like, this is super similar to, to Agda. Anyway, let's get back to it. Hopefully, I mean, yeah, there's 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 differences between Agda and Idris and Cog. With Agda and Idris, they're not as important as the... I mean, they're not as massive as the, as the differences to, to Cog. So just pick up... I mean, you can switch between Agda and Idris fairly easily, usually. There are differences, but they're not... They're not as massive as Cog. Okay, uh, so... What can I call this? Uh, we've got the Empty... Empty, is that a good name for it? Empty? Sure. Okay. So monoid has an empty element in a set and a semi-group, and we've got a couple of proofs. What I'm going to do is uh, import the semi-group actually. So if you open, if you open a uh, record, it just brings all the uh, operations into scope. Otherwise, I'd have to do like uh, I'll show you what I'd have to do otherwise. So uh, what is it? There's there's two uh, there's two things for a monoid, two extra properties, and that is. What is the property? It is that empty a equals a. That's left identity, is it? Right identity is the other way around. I'm 
I'm just checking that I got left and right around the right way. I think I did. Oh, uh, we could probably left. Yeah, instead of identity zero. Maybe. Actually, I think, I think identity's fine. I think I got it. I think I got it right. The right way around. If you if you notice that I got this left and right mixed up, let me know. I think I got it the right way around. All right. So that's uh. So that's a monoid. So let's uh, prove that our uh, that our operations are monoids, not just semigroups. Um, I'm just doing proof search at the moment for everything. Okay, so I think what's happened here... Let me think. So, did a search for empty. So, and... True. Yep, so that should be that should be the identity function. Okay, cool. So, I did find... Uh, I did find this. I just did a proof search and I did find that. So ignore the argument, and that's so true and something else. So this is uh, the so left out identity is true and something equals something. That makes sense to me. But here we've got right identity is something and true is the original thing. <coughs> and if you look at the definition of and. Look at the definition of and. Notice how it's on the left-hand side of the and that uh, that we're splitting on for the implementation. So it's not able to find it's not able to find the uh, it's not able to do a proof search for that because the left-hand side splits on the left-hand side, and the left-hand side is for all. We've got a for all in there. Okay, so what we just need to do is and write identity. So that should be uh, this. I'm trying to look for the biggest program proven by Agda. Yeah. Um, there have been computer generated proofs that are too complicated for uh, humans to even review at the moment. So our computers come up with a proof and we're not able to uh, to verify that proof because well we're not I mean it's verified but it's uh we're not able to actually check the proof because it's so complicated so I just need to split on uh, what the problem was that because it's left hand side we need to split on um, we just need to split on here so this should be should better split on A here. Yep, there we go. Raffle, raffle, that holds. So now I should better use and write identity. Cool. So and is a monoid. Um, what's that thing? Is it a three squares? Three squares problem? Or three triangles problem? Or three... Is it a three square problem, is it? Nah, it's not, it's not this. It's not that. It's not what I'm thinking of. Um, there's a geometry problem, I think. Three color problem, is it? Four color theorem, that's the one. Four column theorem. So, there's something interesting here. Um, proof by computer. Let's see that.
pretty sure the four color theorem I'm pretty sure that this has a uh, massive massive uh, proof that was generated by a computer somewhere and no one could verify it because it was just it was like I think it was like some like a hundred pages or something it was like absolutely massive. I think it's the full color theorem. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I might be thinking of something else. I must be thinking about something else. I thought it was the full color theorem, but if anyone knows what I'm talking about, there is there is there was a famous proof that was done. Um, but no one could uh, actually could actually read the proof because it was a couple hundred pages, or at least a couple dozen. It was absolutely massive. Oh, here we go. Yes, one cannot verify the proof by reading it through. It the computer generated part is far too long. It took 50 days of computing time. Okay, so there you go, yeah. So it was, I don't know, I don't know how, it doesn't say how long it was, but it took 50 days of a supercomputer in the 70s to be able to calculate the proof, and then it spat out a proof and no one could read it. But anyway, full color theorem is true. It actually turned out to be, I guess the proof might have been right, who knows. That is, I, I don't know if I can find any more resources on that, but yeah, that's, that's a good read. That's, that's interesting. I, I, I remember reading about it somewhere. But yeah, even if you, if you, even if you use like a computer generated proof, it might not be the most useful to humanity. Okay, so we got monoids. I think that's pretty good. Um, what should we move on and do now? Uh, got monoid. What's a cool monoid? I think that's all right. Let's let's stay there. Um, I was playing around with some things last night. I wonder if I was playing around with anything cool last night. I was playing around with Agda. I was just refreshing my ideas on, on Agda. Um, yeah, let's uh, move on to something even bigger. Yeah, let's move on to something even bigger. Yeah, I've got um, I've got something that I wanna I wanna have a go at. Um, uh, it is zoomed a little bit. That's the original size. Okay, so uh, let's work on. Has anybody seen this data type before? These? Let me know if you've seen that before. It's a really cool data type. Has anybody seen this data type before? So this is actually in a in a package on on Hackage, which is uh, it's called these. It's in the data dot these, I think. Yeah, data dot these. 
And this is basically the definition, so it's got three constructors. You can see how similar this is to Haskell. Except we use GADT kind of syntax in Agda. Um, but you got three constructors, this is, which has got an A, that which has got a B, or these. Well, that actually calls it these, I usually call it both. Yeah, I think I'll have to call it both in, uh, in Agda for a reason. Identifiers, like these are all just identifiers, so you have to have a different name between the type and the uh, and the value. Unlike in, in Haskell where you can have the same type and same value because they live in different namespaces, in Agda it's all in the same namespace because it's a dependently type language everything lives in in one space. So uh, if you haven't looked at these before, check it out. It's a really cool, uh, it's a really cool data type. It represents uh, computations that have errors and success values. So errors and success values, but also ones that can have errors and success values. So you can use this as kind of like a, a computation that uh, can go through and it can fail, like part of it can fail, but the whole thing might still succeed. So you can kind of collect together warnings and things. That's what it's really useful for. So it's good for collecting together things that might fail and also things that might succeed. If you've got a lot of them, you can put them all together. And these is a really cool data type for that. So what these does is uh, it's got a, uh, a monad. It's got a monad. And for the monad, what you have is uh, if you have more than one uh, failure value, it collects them together. If you've got one, if you've got a success value, it just uses the, that one. So when you flat map them together, all the uh, failures get collected together. And, all the, and the success, you just get the latest success. So it's kind of like either in that, um, I guess it's not really like either, I guess. Um, because either fails, the first failure you've got is the failure, but with this and that, uh, it clicks together. It clicks together the, the failures and, it, and, it, and you get just get the, the last you know, result. So what is the definition of flat map or bind as we say in Haskell? So this is bind. So notice how it has a semi-group. So what it does is for the errors, the collecting together of the errors is just using a semi-group. So we're just gonna do something like that. So it needs a semi-group, we need that. Okay, so that's the data type. And what we're going to have to split on is, I mean to implement bind these, what we'll pattern match on is the same as what we did in the, uh, in the Haskell version, which is to split on, whoops. Not the semi-group, I accidentally split in the semi-group there. Split on the actual data type. Uh, so I just did a proof search for these, and there's a couple of problems that I did. A um, couple of problems that I came up with. Uh, one of them is that... Uh, Hang on, what happened there? All oh, right, yeah. 
So that's fine. That's fine. But yeah, for the uh, for the V for the both case, this actually gets more complicated. That's what I do. Yeah, there we go. So we actually have to match on that part. So we have to also say like, if we run this function, so notice how here we're doing case kx, so run the function over the value. Now we have to handle these cases. So in the case of this, we want this of uh, the left-hand sides combined together. So that is x4, that so let me implement this So this is just a translation of that. And I need to translate this one over so that becomes a, actually that becomes a both, doesn't it? Both x4, and what's this one? This one I'm gonna have to open up the semi-group again because we're gonna use the semi-group operation which is, in Haskell, the semi-group operation is that, in ours it is that. So that becomes both of x5 and x, and then x1. Just getting rid of the places where we don't actually use variables. Uh, I don't think x3 is used, is it? Nope. X2, that's not used. Cool. Oh, yeah, we do use that. Alright, so that makes it a little bit more simple, I think. Okay. It would be better if I rename these things so there's not so many X's, but whatever. Cool, so that's the implementation of bind. What I want to do though is prove that these has the actual monad. I want to prove that these, the monad for these is actually a monad. Uh, so let's write, like what we did with uh, monoid and semi-group, let's do that before uh, for bind. So M is actually something that takes a set to a set. And that means we actually have to, I think we have to write this as a set one just because uh, if you have operations that work over sets, then you have to kind of increment your uh, level by one. That's just how it is. There's, there's, a rep, there's a reason for it, but it's a bit, a bit involved. Uh, is this right? For all A and B, yeah. Given an M of A. And a function that takes A to M of B, get back M of B. So that's bind. I'm actually going to call it what we call it in Haskell, bind. And the laws in Haskell are um, associativity. So this is that for all F and G, I guess we're gonna X in there. So X bind F bind G. That's the same as X bind, uh, what is it? of A, is this right? 
bind G, is that right? That's my error there. Nobody can see my error here, I'm not sure what's going on. Oh, these are meant to be implicit. There we go. Just had to write out more types. That's okay. Cool. So that's the associative operation of a bind. So binding X through F and then through to G is the same as binding X through a function which does F A through to G. So that's, that's the associativity property of, of monads. So let's prove that uh, bind. We have a bind. Mm, uh, I'm just going to call this uh, flat map ease then. Let's call it that. This one will be behind these. So we're going to prove that uh, given a... We don't need a semigroup for this though, don't we? So this is kind of like a translation of this, which we're going to translate this over. So for all a... Let's go S. Semigroup S creates a bind. Is anybody lost so far? Anybody? Is anybody still following? Have I lost everyone? I haven't had any... Uh, Anybody chatting for a while, so I guess I've lost everyone. Because everyone's super confused. Who is not confused? Who's following? Who is who needs some help to follow this? I'm assuming I'm assuming because chat's quiet that everyone's completely confused. I think I lost everyone when I started talking about these. You're in awe? What's happening, Freeman? What's what's up? Good to see ya. How's it going? There's some other people in the chat that are... Well, they haven't been in the chat today, but... Uh, some other people in chat that, uh, that do things around AI. You might want to talk to them. Uh, check out... What's his uh, username? A Mathematical Way. A Mathematical Way. He's... He does he does some some things around machine learning and uh, he's really interested in verification as well so just check out that. Is for all in Agda like writing a set or does it go to a different universe or something? Yeah, so for all is kind of um. For all uh, is a way of introducing a variable where Agda will infer the type. So usually so we don't have to we don't have to use for all in Agda. So what we can do is here is uh, introduce s. But I have to say S is, what is S? Yeah, S is a type, right? So yes. So for your for the first question, if we're all like writing a set, yeah. So that so for all is like that. In this case, for all that is the same, um, but it does a lot more. Uh, for example, where have I got it? Up here, I have uh, for all B. And so here, this is not the same as saying for all set. That's not that's not right. It's the same as saying for a bull. 
So, the, so really what for rule is, is basically like introduce this variable and I don't want to say what type it is, just let Agda infer it. So Agda will just infer it. Does that make some sense, Borders? Is that... It's just uh, introduce a variable and, and infer, the, infer the argument. So here we're even using like a for all with an implicit argument. So here this is set, I think. Yeah, that is set. So I could write that or I could just write for all. So I just, I mean, I use for all for everything until things start not being inferred, and then I then I start typing it out. Like for example, before I was writing this out, and I had it for all f. But notice how this is highlighted in yellow. That when it, when it's yellow, that means I can't can't infer. So got rid of that, put in the type, and now there's no more yellow, and everything compiles. So yeah, so I use for all until until things don't uh don't infer. You barely get what you're doing, but you're coding fast. Okay, um, what? So, um, okay, I'll I'll go I'll review what we've what we're doing, right? So there's a style type called these. This is a way of uh, representing, um, it's basically representing like errors and also results at the same time. Um, so you got like usually in either you've got left and right. That's what these correspond to. So left is error, right is the value, like the the actual result. And so that's that's usually how you use either. You have errors and you have success values. Not always how you use either, but but often how you use either. So you've got errors and values. With these, you've got errors and values, but you can also have them together. So you can have a value, you can have like a result that you're going to return at the end of your program, but you can also have errors with that program. So you might have been doing something, something errored out, but you can still get a result. Um, so people can use this as like either logging or warnings. Um, but these A's get collected together, that's the interesting thing. So if you come down here, we see semi-group. Semi-group is used often. So semi-group, there's a semi-group on bind, that's what we're we're using. So semi-group. So basically all the when you have uh, multiple success values, it'll collect together the uh, errors together using a semi-group. And what we are going to do is prove, like because I looked at this, when I when I first was uh, when I first found this found this data type, I, I noticed uh, you know. I was looking at this, I'm like, well, do the monad laws hold? I'm like, well, semi-group has got associative property and bind, what we're doing with bind is an associative property. Oh, thank you, uh, I'm Fapo. Thank you for the uh, for that follow. So when I first looked at this, I saw like, you know, semi-group is associative and the uh, and monads are have like an associative property. Maybe there is like a correspondence between those two. Um, but I wasn't sure, so... Um, I actually did, I did this proof a while ago, I remember doing this. I did this a long time ago though, so I'm gonna not remember it. Um, but yeah, Leech does actually have a monad. It's actually, it is it is a real monad. And so that's what I'm going to prove. I'm going to prove that um, that these, this data type these, does have an actual monad. It's not it's not just a line over here, it's not just made up. And I mean, in Haskell you can just make it up, right? You can just write bind and as long as the type checks, you know, you can ship it, but it might not actually be a real monad. And so that's what we're going to use Agda for to actually prove that it is a monad. So I've re-implemented flat map. So flat map comes over from this bind here. So if you look at the source, this is bind. And that's what I ported over to Agda. It looks similar in some ways. There's a little bit of syntactic difference, but it's, it's very similar. So I've ported that over. And uh, now I'm writing bind. So this is the definition of the bind type class. So this we've got bind here. So bind has got the you know bind function. We pronounce this bind. That's the bind function, which is just you know it, it, it's flat map. If you look, if you know Haskell or Scala, it's flat map. So m of a, a to m of b, and you get back an m of b. So that's just bind or flat map from Haskell and Scala. But with Agda, we can also write a. Uh, the requirement of a proof. So this is equality. So prove that these two values are equal. So prove that that value is equal to that value. Um, and this is the associative property of, of monads. So running it like that is the same as running it like that. So we have to prove that for all inputs, so notice we've got a for all here. So for all the inputs, so for all x's, which are um, m of a's, so for all of m of a's, and a function from a to m of b, and a function from b to M of C, prove that this this uh, associative property holds. So we're just going to prove that this is a monad, really. Um, we're going to be a little bit more fine grained. There's there's kind of like a hierarchy. There's bind, which comes before monad. Um, all monads are binds. So I'm just going to doing a little bit more granular granular than saying, hey, this is a monad. But you can think of this as just a monad. 
So hopefully that review clears things up a little bit. I know that I, I like to go fast. I'm sorry about that. All right. Does anyone want to guess how we would implement, uh, how we would start with this proof? So I'm just saying that the bind in our bind type class, well, it's not, we're not actually writing type class, our bind record, this bind operator is flat map these. All right, anyone want to guess how we would implement the associative operation? It's been a while typing out the type of this because it's it's gonna there's gonna be a lot. So I think there's also gonna maybe be an S in here. I'm also I'm not very I'm not great at Agda. I mean, I, I kind of know the syntax in that, but like, I'm probably doing things that most Agda users wouldn't do, so. That's it. So this is a massive type that I'm typing out. Is that right? Something like that? Stuff that up. Oh, there we go. Cool. That actually, I actually got something there. All right. So I, what I did is I just uh, took this type this associative type and I just instantiated all the all the cases where we're using M I instantiated that to these and I instantiated the usage, usage of our uh, bind with uh, with flat map these which is our actual uh, implementation for our uh, for the these data type so that's what that looks like that's the associative property on the flat map these function 
All right, anyone want to guess how we would implement this? If you've been, I don't know, how, how many people have been following along since the beginning? Probably not many. If you've been following along since the beginning, uh, what we saw was uh, we pattern match. Uh, sometimes, like in, in Agda, we call this case splitting, but uh, it's pattern matching in, in programming. So we pattern match. Using pattern match will simplify. Uh, we'll get rid of these variables. So instead of having variables at this uh, level, let me show you what that looks like. So here, this is uh, proving that and is associative. So notice here, this is the this is the goal. So before we had, uh, if if we didn't have uh, if we didn't have this true here, this would not be true. That they'll they'll just say a. So say a and b equals, uh, well a and b and c equals a and b and c. So just proving the associativity. If we didn't case, like if we didn't split on the A, if we didn't pat match on the A, this wouldn't be true. But because it's true, we can actually go to the definition of AND, and the and, definition of AND actually set like splits on true as well. And because it splits on true, then it says like, well, true and B equals B. So this will actually get simplified to B and C equals, and then it'll do this side as well, which is true and then and B and C, so B and C will come out as that. So then we'll just see that B and C, B and C. Okay, done. That's the proof. So then we can put in REFL, which is reflexivity, proving that because both sides are exactly the same. So the idea behind <coughs> proving things is usually to pattern match. And we were going to pattern match on this X, I think, yeah. So this is the these that are type. I'm just going to do proof search on the simple ones. So if you flat map on this, then you're going to get back this. If you flat map on that, you're going to get back that. And that's because of the definition of flat map. If you look at it there, that's the definition. So we, in, in the case of this, we just return back this. So that's easy. Obviously, we're gonna uh, that's associative because we're just gonna return back the argue, the first argument all the time. That's easy. Um, for that, we're going to just uh, run the function over the argument, and so that's easy for it to see that is associative. It gets a little bit more complicated with both because we can't just do a proof search. If you look at the implementation up here, what do we do in the in the both case? I'm gonna rename that to uh, F. Simplifying this a little bit more. There we go. I don't know if that, that that simplifies things a little bit for me. I just I'm just, I'm just um, made all the like all the type variables consistent basically. Well, all the variables they have the same type consistent. And used underscores where things aren't used, which just make it a little bit more simple as well. When you see underscores, you know that that thing's not going to be used. Okay, um, so what's what's interesting about this, uh, both both case, is that we actually run the function. We run that function over the result, and then we do things depending on the result of that. So we'll have to do something similar in the proof. That's usually uh, that's just usually the case if you uh, if you see something in implementations. Uh, sometimes you'll have to do it in, in the 
uh, in the proof. Especially if like you're doing something with the result of something, you'll have to do that in the in the proof as well. So we'll have to run this function f over over our uh, thing here. So we'll call that r. Alright, does that generate all the cases for us? And so what do we need to prove now? So the, that case should actually be simple, right? Flat map both with that equals both. Okay, so that seems like it should... It should be raffle, I thought, but no. Let's look at the actual goals. Uh, I'm just going to go one more level with uh, this. Well, the reason is that, um, hang on, we can't actually run it another good, more time, can we? This, well, that we can, okay, so. Okay, so we're getting, we're simplifying this out, that's easy. So what, what I've done is I split apart uh, all the cases for that as well. So if we actually have a result, we're going to run G over the result. So I'm just uh, splitting that as, out as well. So just saying what happens if uh, what happens with the result of G? If it's both that and this, then it's uh, raffle. If I put in a question mark, I can see exactly what that is. So it's proving that flat map both and there, with G resulting in this, is the same as both and flat mapping with uh, G resulting in this. So it's just proving it's the same. Uh, and it's uh, Agri is able to find that as Riffle. So then we've got the tricky case where uh, if we run both with that, and then we get back at both on the second flat map. So the first flat map returns both and then, what was it? Both that, was it? Both and that, yeah. So if the first flat map returns that, then equals both, and then both with both equals that. So this actually gets complicated because we have to use the semi-group. Uh, feels like the first one should be simple though. Both, if we get both, oh no, because that yeah, uses the semi-group as well. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do is, oh, that one does actually work. That one does work. Why does that one work? Both L and this. Both and this. That doesn't make sense to me. Both L and this, so if the result of that function is this, then don't we use the semi-group? We do use the semi-group. I think we've made a mistake in the flat map. I think we made a mistake in the flat map somewhere. I thought I copied it over from Haskell, but maybe I made a mistake somewhere. So. If if we flat map on both, and we get back at this, then we get, then we append, yeah, okay, so we append in, okay. Yeah, that's right. And then we put these, yep, that goes both, and then, 
That one goes to both. Okay, so I don't think we did make a mistake here, did we? This A flat map. Yep, so that's the same. And that's the same. Okay, I think flat map is right. For some reason this is getting weird though, because if we flat map both and then this... So this should mention, I think, the... Uh, This should mention that we're doing a uh, Hey Sulking guy, how's it going? I'm just trying to figure out No, this is uh this is not Haskell, this is Agda. People requested Agda, we wanna wanna do some proofs, wanna do some dependent typing, so I'm just playing around with this. Um I'm getting a bit I'm confusing myself a lot actually. Um I'm trying to so uh we went through some simple ones, we kind of got warmed up with that. We went some, through some simple proofs of um, what we started off with uh, was uh, the idea of idempotency, which is running a function once is the same as running it twice. Running it twice is the same as running it once. Um, and we proved that that's, you know, that's true for a, a few things. And then we uh, went through and uh, proved that uh, involutions which are uh, the property that running a function twice is the same as running it zero times. So not so if you take not true and you do a not of not true, you get back the original thing you get true. Uh, so that's true for both uh, both uh, arguments. Let me prove that anything if you XOR anything with another value, a constant, then that's also an involution. The syntax is very similar to Haskell, um, except it has uh, a bit more Unicode in it. Uh, so then we went, we we're talking about semigroups. I don't know if, if you're familiar with Haskell, but uh, in Haskell you got this idea of a semigroup. And so we proved, uh, proved some things are actually semigroups. Because in Haskell you can actually lie about things being a semigroup. You can say something's a semigroup, and as long as you implement that function, you can say it's a semigroup. Um, but then there's this other property saying that uh, a semigroup should be associative. So the associative pro property is that uh, if you've got uh, a binary operation, so y if you can say like A and B, or A or B. Okay, mainly doing PHP and JavaScript, okay, cool. Um, so in mathematics, there's this idea of, of, of associativity. And when we use, there's something called semigroup in, in Haskell, um, but the types of semigroup is just that you have a function that goes A to A to A. So just a, a function that takes two A's and gives back an A. Um, so you can say like, you know, multiplication is a semigroup or addition is a semigroup, but as long as you've got like int to int to int, uh, that's a, that's a semigroup. Whereas in Agda, we can actually say that it has to be, it can only be a semigroup if it's associative, which is the actual definition of, of a real semigroup. So in Haskell, we could, it's possible for us to implement the interface, but then, but then, uh, you know, forget to, to, to make sure that this property is true. Whereas in Agda, we can actually, uh, demand that someone prove that this to be true. So I can say that uh, to implement this, to implement a semigroup, you have to prove that it's associative, which is just uh, that the parentheses don't matter in, in the binary operation. So if you've got addition and multiplication, think about that. Those are both associative operations because the parentheses don't matter. You can move the parentheses around. You can move them onto the left side or you can move them to the right side. It doesn't matter where you put the parentheses. Um, it's associative. Uh, there's like negation if you think about like one take two take three it does matter where you put the parentheses so that is not an associative operation so semigroup for example in Haskell you could say semigroup and then put minus as your uh, you know a take b as the implementation of your semigroup but it wouldn't actually be a semigroup because it's not associative uh, but in Haskell we can implement that and everything would, would you know everything would compile but it would break whereas in Agda we can actually say that uh it needs to be associative and then things won't break because you have to prove that it's an associative operation so here we're proving that and is associative um, what do I use Haskell for? I use it, um, I work on this product at work this is called Atlassian Marketplace, it's uh, our add-on uh, it's like an app store but for add-ons for our products Atlassian makes things like Jira, Confluence, Bitbucket, those types of products and you can come here and uh, download add-ons. And this is, involves a little bit of Haskell, not much, a little bit of Haskell. It mostly involves uh, Scala and Scala Z, which are uh, libraries for the JVM, languages and libraries for the JVM. 
Um, but there is a little bit of Haskell involved for like uh, analytics and stuff. So a little bit of Haskell. We're using a little bit more Haskell. Uh, hopefully we'll continue to keep using more and more of it because Scala is not very good. Uh, but yeah, this is like 90%, 90, 90 something percent Scala and a little bit of Haskell in the back, a little bit. Uh, so we pro proved that a couple of things are associative and is associative over booleans or is associative over booleans. Then we came up with, like, we expanded the idea of semigroup to something that's called a monoid. Monoids have empty elements. And that just means that if you, the way to read this is that for given an, uh, like a, given a value in, the, in our semigroup or our monoid, empty plus or our operation with empty is the same as the original value. So if you go A and, uh, like with the empty element for our and it will be true. So a, uh, a and true is the same as A and true and A is the same as A. So if you just have, you've got, kind of got this idea of an empty element or an identity element where doing the operation with that element is the same as uh, not doing the, the operation at all. And then we expanded through to these and these, it's starting to get really complicated, but uh, the idea is that um, these is a data type that collects errors and values together and we can prove that this is also associated, but in a slightly different way. And that's what we're working through right now. So the uh, Agda is uh, similar in syntax to Haskell. Um, I just got a little bit more Unicode in that though, but it is similar. So I'm not sure why here. Oh, okay. There is raffle. Okay, cool. Okay, so the only implement. Okay, this is making more sense. Okay, now that I've come back to it, the only interesting case should be when we get both from from these. So when we get both, we have to uh, use the semigroup. And if you look at the implementation of both, so we're going to do this. But with both, we're actually going to run the semigroup. We're going to actually run this uh, bind operation again. So I think that's the I think that's the difference here. Yeah. Okay. So that's why it's interesting because we're going because we're doing a uh, flat map. We've got two flat maps, right? So we're going to do flat map. If we flat map to a that, that just means running the function over the over the value. So that's easy. So then when we do a both, and then we get back at that, <coughs> and then we run that that through um, the other flat map, that simplifies it a lot. So we can just do refl, 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 basically all of them except for both. When we've got both, we're actually going to have to know what the result of running the second flat map is going to be. Let's do it one more time. All right, so now we expand it to pretty much every possible case. These ones are simple, so we've, we've already got those. But when we have two boths in the way, then uh, things start getting interesting. And what's going to be interesting is that uh, with this, if you look back up the implementation, if you look at this, uh, hang on, if you look at this one, where we use both and then we result in this, you can see that we actually use the uh, semigroup operation. When we have that, we don't. We just return both, back both. So this one looks a lot more simple, and this one uses a uh, uses semigroup. So we should be able to say down here. Uh, there we go, a little bit smaller. That one was figured out to be refl. That's easy. That compiles. This one is not going to be figured out, and neither is this one because they both use the semigroup operation. These both use semigroup. So we're going to actually have to use the proof of associativity in our semigroup. We're going to have to use our proof up here that uh, semigroups are associative in our proof that uh, that our flat maps are associative. All right, have fun, socken guy. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming in. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna um, what can I do? Uh, I'm gonna do a couple of different ways. I'm going to prove this in a couple of different ways. I'll go, I'll, yeah, let's prove it in a couple of different ways and I'll end there. I'll show the, like, 
I think there's like three off the top of my head different ways we can uh we can write this. Let me uh so first of all I'm gonna open up uh the semi group. So we're gonna use the semi group, we're gonna use the associativity uh proof. We're gonna reuse that proof in our proof that uh these is associ associative. Now let me also just chuck this in here, associative these. Does that work? There we go. Okay, cool. So the only two things we have to prove now to prove that these is a uh, has bind. Actually, we could do one more thing after this. Actually, would it be worth doing that? Um, we could go to Monad. I think Monad is pretty simple. We can do that. Thanks, second guy, for the follow. Uh, let me. I just realised that my notifications don't have sound. Let me just fix that up real quick. Okay, um, yeah, so we'll quickly prove this. Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, I'm going to do it this way. So begin. Yeah, this is going to be probably in one second. So uh, Agda's got this idea of uh, equational reasoning. Equational reasoning is the, uh, that's what it's called. Uh, it's actually got a library for something called equational reasoning, uh, and that comes from. Oops. This uh. This propositional equality library, this propositional equality library has this uh thing called equational reasoning in here. So I come in here. What I need to um, write down is what we're actually trying to prove at the moment. So if I comment this back out. This is just the syntax for it. I just I just remember the syntax for it. It's I think editor integration could be a lot better for this. No, oh, I've still got this begin up here. All right. So what we need to prove is in the case that we've got um in the case that we've got both. Um, actually no, in this case we've got this, don't we? Hang on, this. Yes. Yeah, so you can see here we've got the pipe. We've got the pipe, and then we've got this. So we have to prove um, when we have this. What is it? Keeps going. I'll keep. I'll, I'll, goal keeps going away, which is really annoying. Um, whoops! What's up in that? Let me just move this down. Sorry, I'm calling out. So we have this, but what we're actually trying to prove. Is that uh, in the case that we have this, we're going to have uh, what is it? This and we're going to pr be proving like the associativity of uh, of our operation. I think it's this, is it? Something like that. Yeah, I think it's something like that. Oops. Uh, things are a mess here. Alright, let's go there. This is what the actual result's going to be. That's what I'm, oh, I'm trying to get at. This, this is what the actual result's going to be. By running a uh, flat map and you get, like, running the flat map, you get both and both and then this. And this is what the actual result's going to be. Something that looks like that is going to be uh, this. For the left hand side, it's going to be this. So if you flat map it, you come out to this. And that's what it's going to look like. But on the, um, on the right hand side, what we're going to have is this. Which is uh, L one. Uh, 
parentheses around this side. So if you calculate it out, if you look at this, one is going to give us uh, what it looks like on the right hand, on the left hand side, and that's going to be what it looks like on the right hand side. I don't know why it keeps doing that. There we go. So this is what we need to prove. So this is called uh, equational reasoning here. This is the uh, the syntax that we're using. Uh, it's just a library in, in Agda. And what you can see it as is uh, on the left hand side here, on this left hand side, uh, is like the uh, what we have to what we end up with. So at the moment, like when we start when we do a begin, we have this. This is the left hand side of our proof. Then it's going to run through this thing. So this is going to be on this side. It's actually going to be a function. This is going to be a function that we run this side on. We run this input on this function over here, and then we end up with this. And then this means QED. So that means the finish of the proof. That we finish the proof. So uh, what what's going to happen basically is um, this is an explicit way of writing down what our goals are. So our goal is this. Oh, sorry. Our current state is this. Uh, we're going to run through this function, and this is like a kind of our goal because it's right next to QED. This is our goal that we're going to be uh, going towards. So we're going to be transforming. Uh, it's just an explicit way of writing down like the, the the state of the proof at the moment. So the state of the proof starts off with this. Run it through a function. We get this proof as an output, and then we can say QED. And so we're just saying that this thing here is equal to this thing here. It's just an explicit way of writing out um, our intermediate state while we're proving things. It's just a nice way of doing it. Um, I'm going to like I know how to how to do this, so I'm just gonna gonna go through it. Um, we use something called congruency. Um, the the reason is right. Um, we're saying that we want to prove that uh, these properties are the same, um, so we can reuse this uh, associative property on on our semigroup. Um, so that will prove that these two things are the same these two parts here, that if we use the associative property on semigroups, that'll prove that these two things are the same. But notice that we're within this this constructor, the constructor called this. So we basically need to say uh, congruent to the this constructor, whoops, congruent to the this constructor, uh, use the associative property. property. So I should be able to write in this in here. No, should be able to write in this. Should be able to. Okay. And then, oh, there you go. Proof search found it. I just press Control C, Control A, which is just a normal thing that I do every time I basically have a hold. Press Control C, Control A, and you can see that uh, Agda has figured out that if you put an associative in here, then yeah, then that works. So there. Yes, this is the green power guy. This is Puffin Fresh. How's it going? Veg Vegard Vegardno. How's it going? This is me. I am writing some Idri uh, some Agda. I was about to say Idris, but we're writing some Magda. And uh, what we've just done is proven that uh, the these data type, which is uh, from Haskell, the these data dot these, we've proven that that uh, is an associative operation. The monad is associative. So the monad is actually a monad. But well, we've, we're, we're most of the way through that proof. So I'm talking about this. Um, which is using equational reasoning in Agda, which is a library in Agda, to prove uh, to prove a property. I'm going to do the same thing with begin with uh, with the both case. Prove prove us you're human, please. Uh, I'm not very good at that. I'm not very good at this human thing. All right. So we're using the equation library, uh, equation reasoning thing. So I think in this case, it's similar to the, to the if you run it through in your head, um, flat map with resulting in, in you know, this will result in this. And both will be similar, but just, uh, just with the both constructor instead. Uh, 
this is uh, using uh, it's, so actor is um hmm, how, how would I explain this? so actor is a uh, language it's a programming language uh, but it's got dependent types and so the idea behind uh, dependent types is being able to write uh, being able to use types as a, as a logic system as like a f complete logic system like in Haskell when we write down types we get a logic system but in Agda we get uh, the expression of every possible value as a type as well so we can actually use it as like a f like a full on, on logic system so this is this is actually using uh, so this is programming this is actually uh, proving things using programming so it's actually using a programming language as a logic system to be able to prove things um, and so yeah so it, in a way it, it, it is logic it, it, like, I mean, all programming is kind of a logic in a way, though. So it's like I think all programming is is some sort of mathematics. It might not be a most a very interesting mathematics, but it is some sort of mathematics. Um, so this is, I think, a more interesting form of mathematics, though. Uh, it's not something that we can use every day, but it is something that we can use sometimes. And what I'm doing is something that I do use a lot, which is the data.bees, which is a Haskell library, and I've uh, I'm trying to prove something about it. Did you get into the dependent type stuff from Haskell or Haskell from type theory end? No, it was definitely, um, I got into Haskell coming from like JavaScript and PHP. I actually got into Haskell from that direction. Um, and then I kind of got interested into Agda from, from writing Haskell. Um, I am, I'm, I do know a little bit of type theory. I've read some books on type theory and that, but I'm not, I'm not great at type theory and I'm really not good at, at logic. So, uh, so if you see anything in here, try not to uh, try not to copy me too much. Yeah, JavaScript and PHP to Haskell. Yeah, I was working as a web developer. Um, I was working as a web developer doing PHP and JavaScript, and I thought, you know, this there's got to be something better than than uh than this. And so I started looking around. Everyone on Hacker News. I was reading Hacker News at the time, which I don't anymore because that, that's a waste of time. Um, but yeah, I was I was reading Hacker News and Hacker, someone on Hacker News was like, "Hey, Haskell is very different. Uh, people should check out ha uh, check out Haskell." And so I did, and instantly, instantly, I'm like, "This is the way I should be programming. Like, this is the way everyone should be programming. This just makes a lot a lot of sense to me." So I jumped into Haskell. So what I, what we need to prove here is that uh, both it's the same as that. That's what we need to prove. Uh, same as that one. I was at uni at the time when I started picking up Haskell, and uh, uni was trying to teach us um, like Java and C sharp and that. And I was like, yeah, this is kind of like I mean, it was a little bit different from PHP and, and and JavaScript and that, but it wasn't it wasn't so different. So wasn't wasn't particularly interested. So I started investing more time in Haskell. I read the uh, Learn You Are Haskell. I kind of started using this book, which is not a great book at the moment, but uh, at the time I, I, I really liked it. I went through this book. Uh, the best book for Haskell right now is this book. It's really, really good. Absolutely awesome, this book. Not cheap, but uh, but good. Really good. But yeah, I, I just decided to learn learn Haskell. All right, uh, so we're going to use this associative property that on semigroups again. Come on. Here we go. That's our proof. That's the proof, okay. So the top level statement is, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go the abstract version. So the abstract version is, um, I don't know if you know much about uh, about monads, but in monads you've got, uh, yeah, exactly. I'm trying to prove that bind is associative. So uh, bind, this is pronounced bind, which is M of A through to M of A, uh, sorry, A to M of B, and we get back an M of B, so this is, uh, this is the monad, monad operation, bind, we pronounce this bind. 
So uh, bind is associative. And so this is just the associative property. So that x through to f through to g is the same as x through to a function that applies a to f through to g. So that's just the associative property, but on this bind operation. Uh, and so I've got this these data type up here. Yeah, these. And these actually uses, uh, so its bind actually uses something called a semigroup, which is something that we went through a little bit before. Semigroup is just a, fun uh, just a binary function that is associative. So parentheses don't matter. So in this form, you can just say parentheses don't matter. So for these to be associative, we actually need to use the semigroup. And that's the interesting thing, because uh, in, uh, in our implementation of bind, we use the semigroup to combine things together. So when you, uh, with the, I'll, I'll go back to these, I'll show what these does. So these, the way you can think about these is that uh, we've got this, which is like an error, that, which is a, some sort of successful result, and we've got these, which is uh, errors and results. Yeah, I got profunctabot in here. That's actually just lambdabot, but I, I, lambdabot, the username lambdabot was taken, so I, I chose the better form of lambdas, which are profunctors. Okay, so uh, this, yeah, so this is like a error, that is like a success, um, and these is a way of basically having errors and successes at the same time, so people can use those like warnings, so you can actually go through computation, get success, 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 and then you can uh, have little errors on each one of those as well. Um, so it's just a way of like collecting together, uh, errors together, and the way that we collect them together is using a semigroup. So the semigroup just says that we've got some sort of way of combining errors together. So if you get multiple errors, we can combine them together. So that's how that's how this flat map works. And I just copied and pasted this basically from the uh, from this Haskell code. I had to translate a little bit, but basically copied this and translated it over to Agda syntactically, just changing the difference. What does the proof do ultimately? Is it a, like a correctness thing? Exactly like a correctness thing. Yeah. So we're just proving that. Um, so like. Uh, for a lot of the uh, operations on bind, so if we go, come through to bind, um, so bind says here that uh, we've got associativity. We've got this property, which is what I wrote out in active form over here. So associative here, uh, where is that? Yeah, yeah, so this is, this, is, this is the active version of this thing. So that's associativity. Um, and the reason why we have this, why, the reason why we say this, this, uh, this type class in Haskell, why this needs to be associative, is that we can derive a lot of functions from it, but only if it's associative. So we can de derive, um, like these things are derived. We can derive functions based on this type class because of the associativity property. And it only follows if it's associative. If there's, if there's no associative property, then we can write these things, and the interface would match up. Like for example, bind. We could write some, some things, but if we don't know what properties this uh, function has, there's a lot of functions we can't write. So associativity is like a really good uh, tool for our, uh, when we're writing programs in Haskell. It's good for refactoring and also implementing functions. So we can write functions, and we can make sure that they're going to work because of this associativity property. So associativity is really good for refactoring and also code reuse. Associativity gives us a uh, code reuse because we can write functions that we otherwise can't if we don't know it's associative. Um, so associativity is useful practically for those two reasons, refactoring and code reuse. And the reason why uh, we're doing the proof is, uh, yeah, is exactly for um, correctness. We're just proving that uh, the functions that, that this data type is associative or this, this this method or this function on this data type is associative. Therefore, all the all the refactorings and all the uh, um, all the code reuse that we get from this data type and this 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 function, they will follow and they're actually going to work. Um, will your proof actually be used when running Haskell code? No, I'm just running Agda just to prove that this follows. We've already got the Haskell code, um, but in Haskell code we can't really write these proofs. It is kind of possible, but not very practical. Um, Agda makes it a little bit more practical to write the proofs. The sad thing is, yeah, like I'm going to write this proof and I'm just going to basically throw it away because the code already exists over in Haskell. Like this, uh, you know, the implementations already exist and they've kind of got, they got some tests. They got some tests, but uh, yeah, we're not going to actually use this proof. We're just going to, we're, we're going to prove it and we're going to basically throw it away and say, yes, that the code in Haskell actually works. But uh, yeah, it just works. There's no actual uh, 
you know, Haskell verification part. There's just, well, I verified it over here, the Haskell code works. As long as I've copied and pasted it correctly. Like, there's a couple of failure points here as well. Like, if I didn't, like, copy and paste the Haskell code over to Agda, then I could say, yes, the, the Haskell code works, but I didn't translate it over to Agda properly, so, you know, my Agda code works, but maybe the Haskell one doesn't. So there, there is a, a couple of failure points here. But I think I did translate it over correctly. I think I did. Okay, so all up, what we've done is we've proven that uh, that the V's operation, the flat map, is associative. And we've used this thing called equational reasoning, this equational reasoning library. So this is pronounced equational reasoning. So we've, we've verified that this equational reasoning, or we've used equational reasoning to verify that uh, that this part, this subpart of our proof works. So, I like, I like this equation reasoning library because what you do is you put on the left hand side what the current state is and then on the right hand side what you're going to do to the, to the current state to modify it. So this one, we've said just use congruency over this, over the, this constructor and use the associative proof of semi-groups to prove that these two things are equal. So I think that's super cool. I really like this library. I'm going to remove the library though. I'm just, I just want to show a couple of different ways we can use this. A couple of different ways we can write proofs in, in, in Agda. Uh, so one is this. So notice how um, what I'm doing is I'm saying this is the current state, run this function, and then this is the current state. Well, we just got one op we just got like one function to run over the states, so we could just write it like that. So the way you can uh, you can use uh, when you use equational reasoning, what you can do is just compose all of these functions together, and you get the result. And I mean, we don't even have to compose anything together because it's just one. So this is this is exactly um, a proof of this property. So that will work. I'll do the same down here. Hopefully this is making sense to people, this part. can just get rid of the uh, intermediate states. I mean, it's just a syntactic thing, the equation reasoning library. So we can just get rid of that. What we can also do is one more thing. Um, I just got support for something called rewrites. So I can get rid of this and that, I think. And what I can say is uh, rewrite, rewrite, if I can spell it right. So I'm going to bring in the associative. I'm going to bring associative into scope. There we go. So what I'm saying here is rewrite using this proof. In raffle. So this will actually rewrite one of our sides. This will rewrite one of our sides with this associative proof. So rewrite basically takes a proof that two things are equal. And so we've got our proof that associative that, you know, L1, X2 and X have like this, you know, using the associative operation. So it's going to get a proof that, you know, these two sides are equal, even though they look syntactically a little bit different, these two things are equal. Then it's going to rewrite our REFL proof. So REFL is just, you know, two things are equal. It's going to rewrite so that, that the two sides become, you know, syntactically slightly different. So it's actually going to reuse the associative proof to rewrite one of the sides <coughs> to be, uh, to, 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 to have that property. So basically associative is going to just replace the, uh, it's going to just replace these two things in our proof. So REFL will have something like, you know, this. When we write REFL, it's going to say basically this. It's going to say that these two things are equal, but then when we use this uh, rewrite, it's going to rewrite one of the sides to look like that. So then it's just got a proof that these two things are equal. Do you have any tips on getting really proficient with Emacs? I was not a teen hacker. Um, I don't really have any good tips. Um, I use something called Space Max, which I like. A, uh, you know, it's pretty good. Um, if 
you read the Space Max documentation, there's uh, this help part, so you can actually say Space HD, and I think D is like describe. So you can say like describe key, and then you can like, if you find a key that you like, you can kind of describe it. So Control C, Control L, it'll tell you like what functions are there, but you can also do HD M, I think it is, which will describe the mode, and that'll let you find all the hotkeys. So that's a good way to get started. Um, Emacs has got something, I think it's like H, Control H or something. There's, there's, there's different ways. Different ways to bring up the help in Emacs. Uh, but HD is a good way in Space Max if you're using Space Max, which I like a lot. So uh, bring up the, you can bring up the, um, the mode by pressing HDM, Space HDM, uh, and then it'll give you all the hotkeys to press. So that's probably the best way to get started with it. Tell you what, where, where the hotkeys are. Is it your parrot? Uh, it's my brother's parrot. It's an Indian ringneck parrot. There we go. So this is uh, this is another way to write the proof. You really like the parrot? Yeah, they're nice parrots. They're they're they're, they're awesome. Indian ringneck. Okay, so that's, uh, you know, that's kind of like, uh, that's another way to write the proof. Um, so there's kind of like three different ways you can write the proof. You can write it uh, using this equational reasoning library, or you could just explicitly write the proof. Or you can use this rewrite. And they kind of like degrade in like, uh, I guess, uh, in explicitness. So this is probably the most explicit way to do it. Uh, this is like a, you know, it's an explicit way of doing it, but it's not as explicit, you know, it doesn't show the intermediate, intermediate state like this one does. And then you've got rewrite, which is not explicit at all. and just says, you know, rewrite, try and rewrite this thing, which is, you know, it's not, it's not very explicit at all. But um, I guess it depends on... Uh, like, I don't think you can always do rewrite to, yeah, you wouldn't be able to always use rewrite to solve all your proofs. Um, so I don't know, like, I don't really have any good advice. Because I'm not, I'm not, I'm not great at Agda, I kind of know the syntax, I kind of know some of the features, but I'm not great at it. So I don't, I can't really say, always use rewrite unless, I don't know, unless you can't, and then use equation reasoning, and then, I don't know, I don't, I don't really have good advice. I just know, I would probably, I'd probably write it like this. Just using the explicit Kong congruent, I probably would use that. Um, for anything more complicated, I'd probably use this. Anything more than just basically Kong, I'd probably use that. And I don't usually use rewrite too much. I mean, rewrite, I actually kind of like it. It actually looks, it looks, you know, it seems useful there. Um, it's straightforward. But I probably would use it. I'd probably use this instead. But that's just me. I don't, I don't really have any good advice. I don't really know what you should do in Agda to, to prove things, but yeah. Yeah, budgets as a kid. Does that mean you are uh, you are Australian? Um. Okay. How long have we been going? I'm going on two hours. Uh, let me. I'm gonna finish up with um, monad. Let's let's prove that this is actually a monad. Pro so far, we've proved that this uh, you know, it's got the monad operation. It's got bind. But let's prove that it's got monad. Not Australian at all? Oh wow, okay. I just assume based on budgies. But budgies are, you know, native and, and popular pets down here. So, uh, remember the joke that a monad is just a monad in the category of endofunctors? 
Notice how uh, semi-groups have uh, associative and so do bind that has associative. And also monad has left identity which is similar to how monoid has uh, left identities. No problem, Borders. Thanks for thanks for coming in. Uh, hopefully you understood. Well, I mean, it sounds like you did. Uh, judging from your chat messages, it sounds like you understood most of it. That's awesome. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for chatting as well. Thanks for letting me know that you're kind of following at least. This is right identity, isn't it? Um, Emacs has got this uh, Agda, it's called a uh, set input method. So it's kind of something called an input method and it comes with, um, when you use agda mode it comes with this agda input method which means that when you press backslash uh, notice down the bottom of my screen I've got um uh, it's disappeared now but down here I had uh, a heap of uh, characters and so every time I type in a character it like kind of filters so then I can type in for all so it's just back backslash for all and then I get a for all symbol or I can say uh there's sometimes, there's probably actually a, a shortcut for that. Uh, so some, if, if you're browsing uh, Agda code and you want to see what it is, you can press, uh, you know, you can describe character, which is uh, space HDC, which then, yeah, so I can type in for all. I can actually do backslash all. So backslash all, and that'll, that'll give it to me. Or I could say uh, backslash O star, which is how I was getting that, uh, I was getting the asterisk circle before, which is our, our semi-group operator. Yeah, it's a really cool mode. It's really well done. I'm not sure why this is giving us a, a weird thing here. Set is not equal to set one. interesting <laughs> power doing the whistling um this is confusing me monad yeah that's what I've written So why is that not working? For all A, oh, uh, for, no, that looks right. For all A. Hang on, no, that's not right, is it? Is this one doing wrong? Yeah, there we go. All right. Yeah, okay. I think that's what I need to do. Okay. Now, why has it got a problem inferring something here? That doesn't make sense to me. Uh, okay, 
probably have to be. I'll just say that. Okay. Alright. I think I'm getting somewhere. Oops. There we go. Okay. I just need to need to specify more types. That's a mistake. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so that's the uh that's right identity and this is left identity, yep. Which is the same that uh what is it? Return a flat map F is the same as F A. I'll just be have to probably be explicit about types here as well. Is the same as. Is it possible to get paid for this kind of programming? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, if you work for. Actually, they've changed the name, haven't they? Um, if you come down to us. Well, I don't live in Sydney, but if you come down to Sydney, if you come down to Australia and work in Sydney, you can work for. Uh, you can get a job as a proof engineer. Uh, I don't know if they've actually got listed up here anywhere. Um, Sometimes they do. Sometimes they do. Uh, I don't know if they've got a list there, but... Uh, proof engineer dialer 61. Proof engineer is wanted. Here we go. So, uh, the, uh, dialer 61 is uh, part of the CSIRO, uh, which is like a uh, research organization down here in Australia, Commonwealth Research Organization, um, that Basically, funds are, I don't know, funds, funds research into into various products, and one of the products that they're making is something called SEL4, which is a operating system, a formally verified operating system, and it is a lot of people spend a lot of money on this because it's used in aviation, military, you know, things that actually need correctness, things that are you know critically important for correctness. Um, yeah, so they so they make SEL4, which is an operating system that is formally verified. So they use something called Isabel Hull. Which is related to it's not it's not it's not active, but it's related to this idea. Um, so if you come down and work in Sydney, you can join this team working on SEL4 and write proofs using Isabel, which is slightly different but similar tool. You can use that to verify SEL4. So you can actually write an operating system um, using this idea. And so they have they actually what they do is they use uh, Isabel Hole for the formal verification part, and they translate into Haskell as like a high level implementation of. Um, of the of the operating system, and then they go from um, Haskell. They kind of extract it out to, to C. So they, eventually they compile it down to C. There's a couple of manual steps between like the Isabel and the Haskell and then the C. Um, but they've written proofs about the Isabel level, and they kind of translate it over down all the way down to C. Um, then they actually run it on on devices. So yeah, so the militaries are actually using this. Proving programs correct is becoming increasingly important in crypto engineering. Yeah, absolutely, 100% crypto engineering. AI in general, when you produce control signals in a world, you really want it to be correct. So I believe, yeah, yeah. Um, so I believe we will see much more of this in the next gen of programmers. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you don't want you you want. Personally, I would like some sort of verification in my automated car. I want some sort of verification. I don't want to just have tests. I don't. I don't want to be the test at least. Yeah, it's become it's it's not the most popular. There are certain projects. SDL4 is probably like the biggest project. Um, it's actually a Australian project, which is awesome. Um, but there's there's not a huge amount of them. Um, there's also uh, CompCert, which is a certified C compiler. So this is a compiler that compiles C code, and it's actually formally specified. I mean, this still has some certain bugs, especially since C is so uh, badly specified. Um, but this, this compiler actually has a specification and uh, is verified. There's, there's certain projects like that. And personally, what I think we should be doing is, um, like I've, there's a lot of like random tools that I use day to day. Like I use a window manager and I use like audio systems. There's just a lot of things that I use day to day and I think they should be uh, verified. I mean, there is a little bit of a cost to it. 
Uh, they're not the most practical tools. They, there is a little bit of cost to, to verification, like to yeah, to verif verifying. Um, but I still think that there's, I mean, random tools like um, I use Grep. Maybe Grep should be verified. Like what? Like maybe there's some property in Grep um, that should be verified. Why shouldn't we be doing that? I mean, there's there's a lot of tools that I just use that day to day that aren't verified at all, and it's just kind of. I don't know, I think it's a good place to start. Double to in Linux kernel programming doesn't even have tests for the most part. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I mean SEL4 is super cool that they've uh Yeah, been able to been able to verify a kernel that actually runs on hardware. It's super cool. Let's prove Git. Yeah. Uh, so there was this project called Darks. Darks has got a lot of lot of um algebraic properties inside of it. Something it's actually got um, a whole theory behind it. It's called uh, patch theory. Which is super cool, really cool. Patch theory. Um, there's a lot of algebraic properties in, in patch theory, a lot of them. Uh, yeah, here we go. There's a lot of properties here. So they've got commutation, merges got properties, commutation with inverses, because you can invert you can invert like a patch. Um, yeah, so patch theory is super cool, and there's actually like a modern implementation of it, because Darks Darks has, has been around for a long time, and Darks was used for uh, Haskell development, but it was really, really slow. Super slow. Had an awesome theory, but it was super slow. So Pidgeol is a uh, re-implementation of patch theory, based on the same ideas, but uh, it's a fast implementation. It's actually written in Rust, which, you know, it's, it's written in Rust. Um, but yeah, it's a fast version of Darks, basically, so... If we want to prove things, we should be proving it about our Rust code here. I reckon that'd be super cool. I mean, there's a lot of properties as well that we can prove about this. It'd be super cool. Okay, I'm gonna finish up by proving uh, the identity functions on this monad. Uh, so let's make a, is that everything? Return, left identity, right? I think that's everything. It's a monad, these. It's basically that. Return equal that? I think so. I think I think Agda found the solution. I think that has to be that. Has to be that. And pure is equal to that. Yep. Thank you, Agda. You found it. Cool. And bind is our bind these. Really? I thought it would be just bind these s. Oh, whoops. There we go. Alright, so left identity. And I just found the solution to that. Remember how uh, in our example of uh, semi-group... No, for the monoid for our uh, and... It was able to find the solution. Where is it? Here we go. Yeah, it was able to find the solution for the first one, but it wasn't found finding the solution for the second one. I think that'll be the same here. Yeah, can't find the solution. All right, that's fine. We'll have to just implement these right identity, which is just this, but instantiated to our stuff. So flat map these with return should equal. I think, yeah, I think that makes sense. But it needs a semi group. Flood map, please. 
Can I pass the application flat like these? Why not? Oh, that's okay to me. Oh, the return, right. Because our return is that. There we go. Alright, cool. So I've brought everything into scope. What, uh, you know, the general thing that we've been doing every time is split on the interesting argument, which is going to be the X. Split on X. It's amazing when stuff is kind of locked away behind a door, find some of the keys and show you that the whole world behind the door. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Um, thanks for coming in and, and asking the questions. Uh, I, I'm not going to say that... Uh, I'm not going to say that verification is like, you know, the most practical thing in the world right now, but it is something that we should be doing more of, definitely. Um, and it is, I mean, it is practical to some people. Some domains, people uh, use a lot of, a lot of proving things, and I wish, um, I wish we used more of it. Uh, thanks, thanks for asking some questions. Thanks for coming in. What are you doing? Scripting? I thought it was creative, not scripting. Um, well, I put it in, cre oh, I don't know what I've done. Uh, I put it in cr creative. Uh, it's programming. Yeah, and programming is, uh, I don't know, in Twitch, I think it's categorized as, uh, as creative. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that, I don't know. It seems like okay category, it's, it's kind of creative in some way. Alright, so to prove right identity, I've just split on the X, and it turns out that is just reflexive for all of them. So, there we go. That should be, I should be able to just chuck that in there. If there's a better category, let me know, uh, Jojo. I don't, I don't know if there is a better category, but if there is one, let me know. Cool, we're done. V's is a monad. So, I mean, it was a little bit of work. It was a little bit of work, but it was only from here. I guess actually it included, uh, included the monad definition and the semi-group definition. Actually, just the semi-group definition, yeah. You're from Australia, Sydney, aren't you? Um, I lived in Sydney for about a year, um, but I'm not really from Sydney, I wouldn't say that. Um, I kind of grew up in Brisbane, but uh, I'm from Tasmania, and that's where I am now. I live in, uh, live in Tasmania, kind of in the middle of Tasmania. Tasmania. It's a little island off the, uh, off the south of uh, the mainland of, of Australia. So I live in the middle here somewhere, somewhere in the middle there. On this island, Sydney's up here. Um, I live basically in the middle, down here somewhere. But I grew up, I grew up in Queensland, up here, and the temperature difference between these two is pretty extreme. It's super hot up here, and uh, middle of Tasmania is not very hot because uh, Antarctica is down here. But yeah, I lived in I lived in Sydney for a little while. Cool. All right. I think I'm happy to leave it here. We've proven that the these data type. Yeah, it is cold. Yeah, it is cold down here. It does get cold down here. It's actually been pretty hot. Uh, it's been like I don't know if you if you use Fahrenheit. I think it's been it's been uh, close to 100, like 100 Fahrenheit, which is about I think 30. I got to 36 here the other day. 36. Oh, okay. In Darwin, yeah, it got it got, got close to 100, yeah, 36. So it got it got 36 here, which is pretty. It's it's not very often that we get to 36 down here. Yeah, Darwin, Darwin is hot. <laughs> Darwin is hot. Cool. Uh, thanks for dropping in, Jojo. Uh, we're actually I'm just about to just about to finish up. I just uh, finished what I was set out to do, which was uh, I'll go over it real quick. So there's the data type called these in Haskell. Uh, it's a super cool data type. It represents the idea of failures and results together. Um, so either there's something called either in Haskell where you can you can use that as failure and a result, um, but it's, it's val failure or a result. With uh, these in Haskell, it has uh, it's a it's a lot it's a package that provides these data type and the and it has three constructors. It's got the failure constructor and the result constructor, just like how either can do that, um, but it also can do uh, both. It can represent errors with with uh, with successful values. 
And so that's what's inter interesting about these. So you can kind of use it as uh, using uh, represent it as a computation that can also contain errors inside of it. So you can use it as warnings, for example. It's very good. So these is super cool, and uh, it has a monad. And so what we've done is we we'll, we'll first of all played around with semigroups, and the, uh, these has only got a monad if there's a semigroup. So we specified semigroup, and semigroup we actually specified that it's associative. So we, uh, we've done a little bit more than what Haskell does. Haskell specifies this as map end. So taking two A's, we get back an A with associative. Uh, we've specified that that operation has to be associative, so parentheses don't matter in that operation. So that's semigroup. Then we specified that these, and I've implemented, I just copy and pasted this basically from uh, the Haskell package. So just copy and pasted it over and translate. I did the syntactic differences, but copy and pasted over. So this is the this is the bind operation. So this is uh, our implementation of bind. If you look here, that's that. This is bind, and we've copied and pasted this over to Agda. And then what I've done is I've written down the law for bind. Bind is a law, which is that it is associative to. So the parentheses don't matter here. And so I've proven that that to be associative. And what we had to do is, what's interesting here is that in the case that we have two boths, when we have two boths, um, we can reuse the, uh, we're going to, when we have two boats, if you look at the implementation of, of flat map, when we have two boats, um, we're going to use the uh, we're going to use the operation on it. We're going to use the this operation. So when we have both two boats uh, or three boats, we're going to have actually have to use this. Uh, we're going to collect up this this uh, operation, the semigroup operation. And when we have a both two boats and a this, we're going to use the semigroup operation as well. So this is going to be semigroup operation with a semigroup operation, semigroup operation with a semigroup operation. So um, all we have to do is reuse the proof that uh, this is associative because we've collected it. We've done the separate semigroup operation twice. Then we, uh, because, uh, because, but because we've done it in different orders with our flat maps, uh, we have to prove that it's. We have to use the associative proof to prove that they're actually the same thing. You do Roblox Studio scripting. Oh, cool! Awesome. Uh, I bet you don't use this language to do that. I bet you don't use Agda. So uh, yeah, so we reuse the uh, associative operation, um, the semigroup associative operation to prove that the flat mapping or bind uh, on these is associative. And I wrote a couple of different ways of doing that. There's, uh, we're using this rewrite at, in the end just because it's super, super short, but you could actually be explicit about it or you could be super explicit about it. There's, there's a couple of different ways you can implement that. And what we finished up with was saying that uh, a monad, which it adds two more properties on. So we had the associative proper, proper, uh, property of bind. There's also the identity property of bind that you can add on and say it's a monad then, uh, if you've got this return function. Okay. No, it gives you scripting in Studio, just to control one. I oh, okay, okay. I guess uh, scripting is a language in Roblox. Okay, cool. So, uh, yeah, so the final thing we did was to prove that the identity function, that uh, these, that the bind for these uh, has, has identity, where identity is actually equal to that. So if you use that as the uh, identity function or return function, uh, Agda was able to figure out the first one, which is just REFL, but then the second one we had to implement, which is just, you know, we just split on the cases that that is, oh, sorry, these is, and it's reflexive. It's super easy. Cool, so mono was easy, associativity was the most interesting part of this, um, and the idea was just, you reuse the semigroup's associativity property. So it's good that we actually specified up here that associativity, and we actually specify the associativity property because we had to reuse it in our proof that the uh, bind on these is associative. Cool. So that's a, I mean, that's a, that's a little example. I thought it was, um, I came up with this because I thought it would, because uh, I knew that we were going to have to reuse the semigroup property inside of these. So I thought it was interesting because we had these data type, and it was doing something with some other data type, and we'd have to reuse that proof from that other data type in our proof on our bigger data type. So I thought that would be an interesting one to do. So. 
yeah, so that's been fun. Cool, so I've been going almost three hours, so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it there.